Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here, and I'm really grateful that you're here too, because I remember that last time I almost didn't make it, to be honest, because, you know, it was an extra effort to get up before the sun rises and um, battle the city traffic. I had a two uni students on a school holidays in a tow. <laughs> um, but it was great. It was, you know, hearing, hearing Marcus talk was a really an adventure and, and it was a privilege to, to be kind of get an insight into his life a little bit. And some of you were here then, as Michael just ascertained. So you remember when, you remember when um, Marcus said that he, he felt a bit perplexed when he found that his theme was heritage? And then he felt a little bit insulted, did he say? I'm not quite sure. But how do you think I felt? <laughs> um, how do you think I felt when, you know, I was sitting here in the audience and Michael looked to me and he said, I've been thinking about you. Failure, failure is not an easy subject. And it's definitely not something that I strive for or, you know, Sorry, this is a little bit too soon. But um, to start with, I will, I will tell you a personal story, a very personal story that I don't tell very lightly. And um, it's about my daughter. And a few days before her 14th birthday, she developed a tummy pain. That was her drawing of what was happening on her birthday at the time. And it was just a tummy pain but it would not go away. We went to the doctor who sent us to the specialist, who sent us to the specialist, who sent us to the specialist. And not only the pain did not go away, but nobody could explain it either. Imagine months and years of this as a parent, as a, as a mother. I felt really helpless and I felt really inadequate. I was a failure as a mother. At the time, my daughter was receiving a counseling by an EFT practitioner. Now EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. And he rang me up one day and he said, I'm worried about you. Would you consider coming to see me? I was so full of grief and so full of sorrow that I could not really even talk to him. But I did go and see him. And he seemed to grasp the problem and got me to tap on the pressure points some of you might be familiar with the technique, and repeat the mantra after him. And I can't quite remember the exact words, but it went something like this. Um, so he would say it first, and then I would repeat it after him. Um, he would say, like, I'm a bad mother. And then I was meant to tap and say, repeat, I'm a bad mother. Now my eyes were swelling with tears. And he said, I'm the worst mother ever. And there is me tapping, I'm the worst mother ever. And the tears are streaming down my face. And he said, in fact, I'm the wicked witch of the fest. I'm the wicked witch of the... And that's when I started laughing and crying and laughing all at the same time. And I was emotionally really confused. And at that moment, something really profound has happened that I can't quite explain. But for a brief moment, for a brief moment, I seemed to see this situation from the other side of the universe, you know, and I, with utter clarity. And not only was I not a bad mother, but the notion that I was was absurd and laughable. Neurolinguistic programming would call it a paradigm shift. My brain connected my feeling of total failure as a parent with absurdity. And suddenly the fog lifted and I was free. 
The thing is, rationally, I could understand that I was digging my own hole there and that, you know, feeling that way. But emotionally, I was a failure and everything else was just a play acting and pretense and a cover up. The point that I'm trying to make here is that failure is a state of mind. It's, it's a view of the world. It's a judgmental view of the world. I would not go as far as to say that it's, um, it's a choice, because I don't think of anybody in their right mind who would you know, feel so miserable by choice. And fear of failure is the biggest killer of creativity. Yet what they don't tell you when you enroll at an um, art school or engineering or sports academy, you know, whatever it is, is, is that failure, the way we define the failure, is integral part of the creative process. It is not that we're in denial. We just don't want to think about it. Nobody wants to talk about struggles and problems. We want to forget all about them. We want to know solutions, way forward, and happy endings. And so we perpetuate this you know, idea of struggle-free instant success. You know, the, the image of the inspiration striking you at 2 o'clock in the morning and then you get up and prance into the studio and you create something and it, it looks exactly as you expected it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not how it works. At least not for me. I work with clay. It's a wonderful, earthy and very quirky material. When I make something, it has to dry really slowly for days. If it survives drying without cracking, then it gets fired in a kiln to 1,000 degrees. Um, second challenge. If it survives that, I apply glaze to it, which looks totally different before the firing to after the firing. And then I fire it again, only to the higher temperature. And this whole process really lasts weeks. Only after the second firing, I know if the work has survived or not. And sometimes at that point I look at it and I just don't like it at all. When I work on the new things, uh, sometimes more than 50% of work does not survive. But I can't call it a failure. How do I live with that? I have no choice. I'm a maker. I have to make the instinct and the impulse that comes from within. Um, and in my work I'm inspired by the natural environment, the ecosystems, the similarities between various natural structures, and I view us humans as a part of that structure, subject to the same laws and cycles. How many seeds does the flower produce and scatter into the wind in order for one to find a fertile ground and grow? My ideas are like seeds. Um, and I'm not all that different from the dandelion when I feel humble or from an oak tree when I feel strong. So the first rule or, or you know, law of creativity, according to Andrea, is scatter lots of seeds, but don't expect all of them to grow. Actually, if too many seedlings take hold, then you'll have to you know, weed some of them out, and that's, that's really a hard thing to. Second rule, do it for love. Indulge yourself, do it for the right reasons, for passion, for love. Don't try to justify hours of hard work and emotional investment in terms of, you know, market economy. It will look good on a resume. I have to streamline the process, cut down the hours to make it more profitable. That's not creative thinking. That's fear of failure rising its head. Surely you do have to do things for money but not everything you do is for money. The most worthwhile things you do and experience should be just because, just because you can, just because you want to, um, just to see what happens. Free of expectations or rewards. Give yourself permission to pick up the crayons and play. And let me rephrase that. Give yourself permission to pick up some clay and play. Um, while the ex accepted definition of failure is that it's opposite from success, to be below the acceptable minimum, to, to be insufficient, to be below expectations, who is expectations? Who is the judge, the big authority of what should happen? No. 
opposite from failure is open-mindedness. Think about it. Opposite from failure is having an open mind. So the result that you get are not necessarily the res results that you expected, but they're not necessarily a failure. Let me show you a bit of my work. Imagine for a moment that you are standing on a beach or in a forest or under the sky full of stars. The moment of stillness when you feel fully part of this world, when you feel that sense of belonging and connectedness to the stars, the wind, the grains of sand, when you feel as small, as insignificant as a pebble on the beach, and at the same time, you can admire the beauty and importance of that same pebble. These are the moments that I feel connected, inspired, and I feel free. This is the moments which I try to communicate through my work and objects I make. I don't have words for those thoughts, so I'm exploring them through making the objects that speak of them, that allow us to glimpse the holistic nature of the universe and our being in it. I look at many natural forms and I learn from them. Planktons, oh sorry, these are the pollens actually. And there is such a diversity and rhythm and playfulness of form in those tiny objects but what intrigued me most is the abundance of the little individual variations and the complexity and the beauty. These are the planktons. To me, those forms symbolize life. You know, life as significant as mine, fragile and strong, unique and universal. They're nature's artworks as much as everything else is. Nature, of course, never makes straight lines or perfectly symmetrical curves. It grows from the seemingly spontaneous yet ordered and rhythmic way. It is easy to recognize the natural object from a man-made one. While nature creates playfully and organically, we mostly strive for absolute symmetry and balance. But slowly, as our understanding of the world changes and our values change, so do our concepts of beauty. It is amazing how many similarities we can find in different life forms when we look. The lighting, a tree, a river delta, blood vessels. So look, I look at different natural objects and there is a strange familiarity about them. Microscopic images and satellite images share many similarities. And in those similarities, I'm looking for the visual symbols, language without words that will talk about life not human life, universal life. Life that evolves on the edge of order and chaos. When we try to represent natural forms in orderly, symmetrical, rhythmical way, they seem to lack their soul, the essence, what makes them alive. So the old concept of balance in nature is being replaced by the concept of dynamic, creative, diversity, chaos of nature. And that is very liberating. Nature as a playful, abundant creator is much better teacher than nature full of rigid, universal and unbreakable rules. There is abundance, diversity and variety in the life forms, where in theory only one would do the same job. There are millions of different butterflies and there is room for all of them. On this image here, what, what you see uh, on the left hand side is the microscopic image of an uh, eggshell and on the right hand side is a little ball that I created. To tell the truth, I made a ball before I find this image, but uh, it fitted so perfectly one with another that in my mind are forever connected. And that took me to the exploration of what I would imagine as a skeletal parts of the shells and um, corals. This one is based on a particular type of shell which grows in the Adriatic Sea. Fractal landscape. The porcelain that I tended to work with, the whiteness and the translucency of it, it has got the similar allure to the ice. So there was a playful uh, experimentation of, you know, the 
kind of a creating a time flow the way the in ice melts or grows with the rhythm of the porcelain shapes. Australian landscape is full of wonderful inspiration. So I look at the those tiniest form of life that you can see with your naked eye and I try to emulate in a sense but not totally copy the um, evocation of the naked textures. Corals. Corals are a huge inspiration for me. Um, the top image is a microscopic image of a pollen and my rendering of it is the other two images. Uh, these uh, little porcelain planktons, they were displayed in a gallery right in the middle as a huge hanging so people could walk around it on both sides and it was absolutely amazing and I was so lucky. I wasn't sure if I was going to tell you this but it stayed it for three days so it survived the opening and the biggest crowds and the third day the gallery rang me up and here you have to come and see it. The bottom half collapsed under its weight. <laughs> I've learned I make them a little bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> These are little bubble balls. They're quite tiny. And it's, it's, but at, a, at the same time, they're deceiving because porcelain is very, very strong material. If you imagine your, you know, your china cups and the delicacy of that material, which displays in those little bubble balls. And I went as far as I could with that delicacy, you know. At the end I started talking with the shadows of the porcelain, not, not the porcelain itself, but looking just at the impressions it left. And there was, there was nowhere else to go. So I had to really jump there, and I started making really large work. Um, it just happened because I had the um, opportunity to create a large work for the outdoor installation. And it was meant to be very architectural, but my hands just wouldn't do it. My hands just went back into the corals, and it, I really liked what happened there, so it's still one of my very favorite pieces. This one um, is one of the favorite images of work uh, on the left-hand side. It is on the left for you as well because in the windows of the building you can see the chimneys of the kilns that fired those works. And the work itself was meant to evoke growth, growth from the ground and emerging and sort of not quite finished piece. I kind of try to also play with the idea of the, the, the works which are really small to try to make them large in order to kind of bring humans back to the size that we should be in our heads because quite often we feel that we are so much superior to everything else. And this is how we come to the present time. This is the work when I was starting this presentation is um, I was not sure if it's going to be standing or if, and if I'm going to be putting it together. So when Michael asked me to talk about failure, I was wondering if that's a premonition of a sort. I'm very, very pleased to say that there is a happy ending <laughs> to this one. And the work is in a Lawrence Wilson gallery at the moment, together with other beautiful and significant ceramics works uh, from other artists. And this is what it looked like on the opening night when it was lit kind of like a moon, which was part of the idea. Although, of course, of course, it's talking about the planktons. So just, uh, you know, just to, just to kind of finish it with a few more words, it's, in my view, this is this, this whole life thing. This is not. It's not about the survival of the fittest, or succeed or fail. It is really just about having an open mind. Thank you.
Andrew, when you first started or were starting out in your career, you were a bit more, you were saying it was a bit more industrial, so can you talk a bit about how many pots you threw and how long and just what was the story behind that? My training was very different than what you see here on those images. My training was uh, at a bit more traditional pottery training. So, um, and I still tell that to my students that one of the assignments that we had to do in our second year was to throw 30 balls, identical balls, in half an hour. Um, we practiced. Boy, did we practice. And we could do it, all of us. I threw 35. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from, yes, from that background to, to allow yourself to go out on a limb, I would encourage you to do it. I really would. That's kind of all I have to say on that. Thank you. You didn't expand on the failure, which is a theme of your blog about making that work to show the exhibition. Can you speak just briefly about that? Thank you, Graham. Because yes, um, the, the when you look at my profile on the on the um, uh, morning uh, creative mornings, it if you click on it, it will lead you to the blog, where I actually spend time showing all the all the thinking process about the work that you've just seen. And yes, you can see the breakages. You can see the stepping back and in the process of development of the new work. Thank you. <laughs> but that wasn't a question, really. <laughs> yes, please. Andrew, you spoke about your personal um, sort of like situation. Is there any chance that I can go away from here knowing how you're... How it finished? About? Yeah, is she well? Is your daughter fine? My daughter is 20 now. Um, at, towards the end of last year, there was an article in your newspapers about the medical practitioner who arrived from America and has been treating some teenagers from a, a chronic pain. And I wrote to him. And he saw my daughter he diagnosed her after six years. Pre, um, he could not do the surgical procedures here, but he's teaching local doctors at the Royal Perth Hospital what to do. So they performed a very tiny day surgery to release some tendons here, and she is pain-free. So thank you for asking. It's still extremely emotional subject because after all this time, she's learning to to be able to live, to be able to go out. She can go to school now. Yeah. Thank you. She wanted to be in the audience today. She couldn't because she couldn't miss the class, but I think we would have both cried at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> question which have, it, it is an extremely good question because I don't think there are rules to it. Sometimes you just have to put it on a shelf and say I have to think more about it but it doesn't let go. You know there, there are those projects which then you, you put it on a side but your mind still works on it and, and, and no matter how much you try to go away it's still I wonder if I try this. So if that doesn't happen, if you don't feel this emotional, I really need to find out, maybe that's when it's time to let go. So um, unless, of course, you have a pressing deadlines. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're a good point, I guess. Is there an um, overall vision for your work, or does each work build on the last and the next? I always, no matter what I do, even if I try to steer away from it, it always ends up looking looking at how to make something look like a part of nature, but not in the terms of copying it, but in terms of 
us feeling that it's a natural object. So this last one is actually based on very geometric form. It's based on the um, geodesic dome. But I really worked hard to find those little elements which to our minds will read not, not architecture, but nature. And those are those, if you remember that image about um, the blood vessels and the, um, the thunderstorm. Our mind reads certain shapes as natural and some shapes as man-made. And I'm kind of trying to observe and understand that language that we don't necessarily have the words for, but we feel it, you know. And we, we kind of look at something very quickly and interpret it. So I want to play with those points. What, what makes us interpret this as almost alive? So that's kind of what's underlining most of, most of my work even if I try to get away from it sometimes. These are the hard questions, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, and we seem to talk about your work with real care and life and compassion and investment. And at the same time, when you talk about having to put many seeds out and mm. let them go, there's a, um, a disconnection, I suppose. Yes. So to, I wonder how you manage that balance between um, I don't think it's very balanced, to be honest, in truth, you know, there is always uh, that moment. But what I read some, somewhere, actually, in a very, very good book, which I would recommend to everyone, and it's called The Artist's Way, and one of the points that stuck with me was just create, create the abundance of things, even if you don't like it, even if you don't necessarily feel like this is working out, but the more you make them, the more you will find out what works. So the book said it's something like, if you create lots, the good pieces will choose themselves, kind of a thing. And that's sometimes, you know, I, those works that you saw are the, the successes rather than failures. And those are the ones which kind of stood out. But there are many, many, many more which kind of don't get to the grown up stage. <coughs> in a sense. How do you know? It's... I don't know. What, what I tend to do is once I make something that I feel it has potential, I quite often put it on my table or on a shelf that I really have to live with it. So when I wake up in the morning I see it and when I, before I go to bed I see it and I go, I don't like you. <laughs> then it's not going to work, you know. And if I think, oh yes, you could be, you know, you could be nice. So it's really just within. Yes, please. I was just going to ask you an easy question. How, how did you actually transport the big objects? And, or did you assemble In triangles. Them? Yeah, so you assembled them. Uh, they were assembled on site. And it was not an easy process because although we tried, Previously, you know, there was a mock-up at home, but the mock-up was on an old carpet in a gallery. We did it all plastic, and it all slid. So, I had about 50 spares, and I broke all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it was almost not making it. But, yeah. I don't know why we do it. Yes, please. Uh, how long did you work on this uh, this exhibition, uh, this exhibition had, uh, the work had a luxury of time, so uh, I really had a luxury. Uh, I was approached by the gallery more than a year ago. Was it Graham? Graham's work is also in the exhibition. Um, and it, the work stretches for as long time as you have, always, you know. You always work to the deadline, three days or, or a year. So it took almost a year. spoken very much about how you become, um, the object becomes part of you. How do you detach from that? Or you have to sell the object? Or it's a funny thing. Now that I was extremely attached to the, uh, this work is called Shape of Thought, by the way, the one you're looking at in the screen. Um, once it was in a gallery, 
and it was set up and I walked out of the door, it wasn't mine anymore. It's kind of like, for those of you who have kids, once your kids go to school for the first day, and then, you know, they, they kind of just grew up that little bit. And yeah, now it's got life of its own. I've, I've done my bit. So. Okay, last question. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned about the failures. I mean, they are not the failures itself, but you make a beautiful piece and you blaze it and it becomes something which you never expected and it becomes a show. Yeah. And how do you motivate yourself to maybe redo it or make another one or is it the inspirations from nature or I mean, how do you manage your oscillations of emotions? Like how do you put yourself up? I guess it's a natural stubbornness. Um, but what you do with a piece like that is you first, first you walk back and you don't look at it for at least a week. Because quite often it's your expectations that are not met. The piece itself might actually look good. So try and have a look at it again after a week with the fresh eyes. With the eyes from the side like, okay, this is not what I expected, but what does it look like in itself? Now, if that doesn't make expectation, reglaze it. You can do that. Definitely. Thank you, everybody.